Dr. Tom Cavalli, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. <laughs> Pleasure to be here with you, David. Well, it's nice to meet you. And uh, I was on your website at alchemicalworks.com. And it's a very interesting website. I, I commend it to people. And um, I was struck by examples of people who've benefited from your work. And some of the accounts that you put there uh, struck me as miracle stories. So I'll be querying you about that some more as we go on. But uh, but first, let's let's delve into your background, if I may. Uh, where did you grow up? What sort of family did you grow up in, et cetera? I, uh, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Uh, lived there, grew up until my late teens uh, when I began to travel uh, around the world from India to uh, Cambodia to you know, just all over the world. And that opened up uh, my horizons, as, as it were. Um, I was born. How, how did you come ahead. to travel as a teen uh, to uh, to be able to afford it and to and what was calling you to do that? Uh, like you, I'm a fellow traveler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I in my absence, I was very depressed, very introverted. I felt nobody really understood me, and the world was rather strange and not bizarre. And uh, I grew up uh, in a Roman Catholic tradition, uh, which okay. I don't any longer subscribe to. Um, and I just needed to burst out. You know, I just needed oh. to crack out of my shell, as it were. And the way I was able to do that was um, I did a lot of carpentry, which is lucrative. And I, yeah, would, work, yeah. I would work the fall and winter months uh, as a carpenter. Uh, uh, ironically, making uh, these wonderful models of pools that were used for salesmen in California, uh -huh. not knowing that someday I would be uh, replant, uh, you know, plant myself on the West Coast. Um, and that I, I have a, an affinity for water. And I, I've lived by either the uh, Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean my entire life. And it's because I'm a Leo. Uh, the uh -huh. fire sign and uh, when I go in I sometimes kid around with people and say well watch the smoke <laughs> as I dive in because yeah. it kind of it, it kind of baptizes me each time as it were uh, I was born on a very auspicious date that does have some alchemical uh, affinities uh, I was born on August 15th 1947 and that was historically the day that India uh, achieved its independence from uh, England, uh, which I love telling when I, uh, I've i traveled to uh, India, all over India, and I love telling that story. They get all excited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as, 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 do, as do I. Yeah, wonderful. The, wonderful. The, more alchemical, the more alchemical connection has to do with, um, in the Roman Catholic uh, religion, it's the assumption of Mary into heaven. And that was a day that was very, very celebrated by Jung because it was a way of transforming the very masculine trinity into in the inclusion of the feminine, which mm -hmm. goes from a three to a four, which has more to do with wholeness. So it's a very special day. She, you know, in the in the religion, it's believed that she was assumed bodily. In other words, she had spiritualized her body, her matter, Mm -hmm. That it wasn't any need to die and then resurrect. So it has a lot of, you know, uh, of, of alchemical uh, association. Well, at what point did you become interested in uh, non-ordinary reality, if I may say so? Uh, uh, were there certain books that you were drawn to uh, in your travels as a as a young person? Oh, as you could tell from behind me, I'm a, a, a bibliophile. I, I love books. To me, they're like windows uh, onto the world in terms of inner travel. I always, even even during my high school years, always uh, were either in working in libraries or haunting uh, used books. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, this whole collection of the collected works uh, was from a used bookstore. I spent a hundred bucks for it, and uh, I've got a billion dollars in return. Wow! Um, yes. 
it, it was much to do with that in terms of non-ordinary reality. Uh, it was kind of the opposite. I think I was living in a non-ordinary reality. Travel <laughs> will do that to you, right? <laughs> Yeah, oh, I, I, my, my experience absolutely. of travel is that it's, it's an altered state of consciousness. Uh, oh, if you're yeah. going to a place that you don't really know, yeah, and, and maybe you don't know the language, and uh, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, in the time, in the time of Freud, uh, it wasn't unusual to write a prescription for a sea voyage for the very reason that it was very healing, you know, mm -hmm. to get. You know, out of the, uh, uh, the, the 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 tight world that you were living in. Yeah. Uh, today, it's not so much that; it's more like ketamine therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, to answer your question further, um, what I really got into alchemy was in graduate school. Uh, once I had kind of traveled quite a bit, I I knew instinctively I need to settle down, and. Um, uh, I was working as an intern uh, uh, throughout my graduate education at a substance abuse agency. And it was called Community Resources and Self-Help. And the name being uh, that long, people in the community just referred to it as CRASH, as an acronym. Yeah. yeah. Now, I didn't know this is what I call a slow moving synchronicity because I didn't realize at the time the association between that acronym and what happened when I had taken a year off between my ma my master's and my doctoral years. Uh, the short story is that I uh, was traveling between the clinic and Juvie to counsel these girls, these teenage girls. And en route, it was bright afternoon in San Diego. And a apparently a sailor had uh, uh, um, fallen asleep at the wheel. And he was swerving on this uh, two-lane highway and crashed into me strong. Um, and that over the years has really, uh, um, it was a mystery to me uh, that I've only in recent years come to realize the, the import of it. Uh, to put it you know, succinctly, uh, I'm a psychologist, I'm a, I'm a psychotherapist. Uh, that's what I do. But in terms of who I am, I consider myself a healer. And what I mean by that is, um, in terms of the crash, um, in alchemy, alchemy is about breaking things apart and reunifying them. And uh, there are pictures that uh, show uh, uh, physical dismemberment. Uh, you find that even in shamanic traditions. Uh, and that crash, what laid me up for a couple of months, uh, was my dismemberment experience. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And how did the sailor fare? You know, that's a very good question. There's a lot of mystery associated with it because I had done something I had never done before. I stopped en route to pick up a teenage, what I recall was a very young teenage boy who was hitchhiking. And he got into the passenger seat and off we went. And by the time I attained the speed of 55 miles an hour, uh, the crash occurred and uh, when the newspaper we made the headlines the next day it was a hideous picture of the two cars uh crashing and the i never actually saw the the, the sailor we were head to head on gurneys um but i seem to believe that he actually died the mysterious part of it is there was no in the newspaper uh headline there was no accounting for the boy at all. And yet when I went back to, because the car had been impounded, uh, there were uh, impressions on the dashboard, you know, that somebody sitting in that seat had hit it. So you don't I, know, I, you don't know what happened to the boy, how injured he was or wasn't. You know, it's one of those things, whether it existed, what he actually existed or not. Uh, my favorite way of kind of reimagining the situation is that he was my angel. Oh. It was the reason why yeah. I didn't die. As yeah. I, it realistically, it should have. It was a terrible accident. Well, this gets us off to a very interesting start. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, 
So you mentioned graduate school, a master's and a, a PhD program. Where did you go for the master's and what was it in? Uh, both my master's and my doctoral, uh, my doctorate were at what was then called the California School of Professional Psychology. Okay. Uh, uh, it has been assumed now by Alliance University. Right. Um, and they, they were very historic in the sense that they were the first uh, graduate school to separate from the university as a department. So they had the freedom, you know, to teach psychology as they felt it was meant to be. And I, this is in San, the, the San Diego campus, which uh, was a miracle because they have four other campuses. And the only reason why I chose that one is that it was the closest to the ocean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it was fortuitous because uh, I ran into some remarkable Jungian analysts. My first analyst was Robert A. Johnson. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Wonderful author of so many remarkable. books. Yeah. 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 Uh, wow. Yeah, that, that's that's a great entry into the Jungian world to have been analyzed by him yeah. and uh that set of schools, Alliance and all, I've heard they've really, they've tightened up a lot to meet licensing requirements and so on. But oh, you yeah. you were early to get in on the ground floor with uh, with some real freewheeling faculty, it sounds like. Well, they were. Um, they were really remarkable teachers. Uh, but at the same time, there was a lot of tragedy because they were trying to get accredited and they were doing it on the backs of this class. And the stress ended up with a couple of deaths, suicides and murders. I mean, it was really kind of horrific. Wow. wow. Uh, another, another major challenge <laughs> to get through yeah. that program. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a survivor in more ways than one. I like to think of myself as thriving, not surviving. Okay. <laughs> You're a thriver. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, so talk to us about Jung and alchemy. Uh, I know you're you're deeply steeped in all of this, and, uh, uh, and, and you teach courses on it. We'll talk about a, a course that you have coming yeah. up, actually, but let's get further into the interview before we go into that. Yeah, sure. Um, at the time that I was interning as a, as a drug abuse counselor, um, I came to realize that <laughs> there was a common element between what I was doing and the uh, patient client, and that is manipulation. We're trying different ways to manipulate. Um, I'd like to kind of simplify it by saying I was taking a more healing conscious approach but it, therapy is a form, a subtle form of manipulation, where the, uh, the client of the patient is uh, manipulating uh, in a more egoistic, um, unconscious way. And so I became fascinated by that intersection of where we met. And in fact, one of my uh, favorite uh, um, quotes at the time um, is where Jung talks about where two chemicals meet, if there's any reaction, both change. Now, later this became known as a field of what's called intersubjectivity, but the at the time that 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 middle space that was not uh, well studied. Right. And that really is what led me into Jung, you know, because he calls that the tertium, the third thing. And that's when I first encountered Jung. And, um, uh, you know, I know it sounds highfalutin, but it really changed my life. So I began, so Jung has, you know, has become more and more popular uh, as, he differenti as he's differentiated from Freud. You know, his concept of the unconscious is much deeper and broader. Yes. And, and less somatic, biological. It's not just a cesspool of instinctual desire. Right. Uh, it's much, much, much more than that. Um, and Robert Johnson, my analyst, uh, actually had a session with Jung because uh, he had a very big dream. And uh, Jung met with him, analyzed the dream in one session. <laughs> and in that one session, Robert told me it changed his life. It, it really set his path forward. 
And in the same way, it set my my path forward. Um, I was trying at the time, this was in my mid thirties when I uh, got my doctorate and I was trying to, as many students, uh, try to translate my dissertation, which was on the trickster archetype, yeah. because that to me encompassed this kind of mutual uh, ma manipul manipulative space. Um, but I soon learned when I started to translate into a more popular uh, form, uh, basically I wasn't old enough. I just wasn't mature enough. Yes, right. And so I, I put a stop to that. that and uh, went on to, you know, other things in my life. And it wasn't but, you know, many, many years later, when I started to write the alchemical psychology, my first book, and uh, and I had achieved the level of maturity where I knew what the hell I was talking about, mm -hmm. or at least what bit I knew of the mystery. But my intent then and now is to make it useful so it's applicable, that it's not some strange thing with strange symbols and what have you. Yeah, now, when you I was trying to come up with a uh, with a title for the show, I found myself t uh, s s describing you as an applied alchemist. Uh, oh, okay. uh, so that was what I was getting was that. Okay. Uh, that yeah, you were re re well. really working at bringing it into the world and, and right exactly exactly, and, and, exactly. And a certain practicality right i uh i just want to add i don't mean to cut you off but it, it triggers something in my head that as i was preparing for this interview uh I, the tagline that you have uh all the psychology you need to know and just enough to make you dangerous really uh kind of uh set my imagination going and then Good. i thought to myself <laughs> it's, I, I was thinking to myself is david an alchemist whether he knows it or not and why i say that pointedly when you say dangerous um there is a danger in becoming an individuated person because no longer are you just part of the herd the crowd you, you it's kind of in the myth of the hero and the yeah. hero is, has many, many, many challenges because he speaks a truth that can resonate with a lot of people and transform the unconscious mind into something more perfected and conscious. So yeah. uh, I welcome another fellow alchemist. Yeah, yeah. OK, I, I'm willing to take that on. Actually, the two places that I really that Jung's work really speaks to me. One is uh, the journey of the hero as articulated you know, uh, I, I'm blocking on people's name, Joseph Campbell. Yeah, blocking Joseph on names Campbell. these days. Yeah. And and um, and other people who followed in his footsteps. And also s the concept of synchronicity. And one of the questions, because my life has been seemingly just directed by synchronicity. So many uh that yeah. I wanted to ask you, you know, is there a relationship between alchemy and synchronicity? Or what oh, is it? How do yeah. you understand that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I think it's evidence of, uh, of alchem alchemical manifestation. So by definition, and Jung coined that term, synchronicity is an a-causal connecting principle, but it carries meaning. So it's right. differentiated from a just a mere coincidence. Uh, it carries meaning. So that's why I said earlier when I was describing that whole crash scene, uh, which at the time I didn't think of it as a synchronicity, but as it kind of unfolded over the following decades, yes. it carry a lot of meaning for me. So synchronicity is the... Um, simultaneous meeting i would say between the outer reality and an inner reality that that makes us believe uh or or, or at least question whether there is an intelligence beyond just our ego rational mind that there is an intelligence out there that's far greater than ours it certainly um, has, has that impact on me because I tend to be a pretty rational, per I think of myself as a rational person. Uh, and yeah, and I think of the synchronistic things as kind of a wake up call that there's a larger game going on. 
that yeah. that, the, that there is a mystery yeah. and and uh, I'm intrigued by the mystery but reluctant to latch on to any particular metaphysical religious thing that says oh well this is what it is and there's right. a lot of that out there but somehow right. in my right. nature is to resist that right well yes of course the rational mind is always going to resist uh, alternative possibilities because you can't make sense of it. Um, and yet, in the alchemical tradition, when you are experiencing with a receptive mind uh, synchronicities, it's numinous. And the word numinous yeah. means it's a, it's a nod from the, uh, the, the collective unconscious. And you know, just to ground this a little bit, uh, I can give you a very quick example uh, of how this can bring healing. So I had a patient some years ago many years ago actually and he was divorced from his wife uh who had been who was pregnant at the time and he was having affairs and he just uh perhaps because of his cultural background which i won't get into he had it in mind that his marriage and affairs were two separate things and in the course of therapy i was trying to make him understand they're not two separate things you're one person but i couldn't get through to him and i have to confess that i was getting frustrated and at one point, I said to him, you know, not yelling, but said to him in a very demonstrative way, you know, your marriage is like a car crash. And instantaneously, when I said that word, car crash, one block away from us, we both jumped off our seats because we heard two cars colliding. Oh, my God. And so the unconscious, you know, kind of it wasn't working through me to kind of shake him, you know, to wake him up. And that's a very quick example of how a synchronicity uh, isn't just accidental. You know, it, it, it comes into our lives uh, uh, at very particular moments when it compensates for a, a very rigid rational position where you're fixated. It just bursts things open yeah. because it's hard to, hard to question that. It, you know, it just happened. And through therapy, we were able to unpack that and use it to the service of his uh, marriage. Well, it's interesting that car crash was also very numinous for you before that. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I just realized I, I'm using the same uh, metaphor, as it were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that I have a lot of car crashes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not riding with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll always be a seat for you, a safe one. <laughs> yeah, so... So that's an example, I think. Yeah, of... the, the other thing, the other thing I should add, I, I am purposefully, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't agree with everything that Jung says about alchemy, which is quite a bit, because the last thirty years of his life was devoted to alchemy, alchemical studies, and people don't uh, recognize that very often, and. and but I still, I mean, as much as he, the gifts he's given me of insight into this amazing art, uh, which is, to use his word, is psychoid, meaning that it's not just physical, it's not just psychological, it comes from someplace where those two are undifferentiated. It's the beginning of all reality, all creation. But in Jung's mind, Alchem the alchemists were projecting unconscious fantasies. And certainly I agree with that to a point. And I think he doesn't give apt recognition to the possibility, possibilities that some of the experiments actually did work in physical reality, that uh, 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 the Drew professor of, of humanities at Drew University, Lawrence Principe, uh, a contemporary, has literally studied, taken some of the recipes from the old alchemical books um, oh. and actually actually applied them and see what they saw. So it wasn't kind of all fantasy. It was a material aspect to it that was driven not just for the physical side, but also the psychological side. Is, isn't it some, sometimes cre alchemy credited as the roots of chemistry? That there's some uh, crossover there. Absolutely. That these these were early yeah. chemists right. trying to figure out. Okay, right. you know, if you how does... 
So if you so if you trace the history the development of science, just roughly, I, I would say it goes like this: magic, shamanism, alchemy, and empiricism, empirical experimentation. Now you're right. Uh, alchemy was and is the first proto laboratory science. Um, at the time, and we're talking about mid 15, 1600s, consciousness had a what I consider uh, a rupture. Uh, a consciousness was uh, mutating. Um, and what was going on in the minds of people like Newton, who was a practicing alchemist, was uh, 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 um, uh, they were scientists, but they were that word didn't exist in, in those days. And what these people were called were uh, uh, natural philosophers of nature. And so the point is, they were uh, philosophy was then transforming into an applied art. So we might think of alchemy as an applied philosophy, or sometimes they call it an expressive philosophy. Now comes along a man named Francis Bacon, and the whole rupture had to do with a shift in the way that consciousness on a, on a global level was shifting from one that was very immersive. In other words, we were and are part of nature to one, with no small thanks to Francis Bacon, a shift towards controlling nature. And so then it became not an I-thou relationship, but an I-it relationship. Mm -hmm. And for better or worse, I mean, we've got empirical sciences with all kinds of medicines and what have you, uh, which we have benefited from. But at the price of soul, at the price that, and the difference between alchemy and, and, and chemistry, one is more of an experience the other one is more of an experiment. And as you may know in method scientific uh, methodology, you always want to reduce, you know, the amount of subjective phenomena to a, 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 a probability of level of 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. Yeah. That's the very thing where alchemy, uh, which is the study of, of essence. So like in homeopathy, for example, uh, they prescribe subclinical doses to a chemist that would make no sense. Right. But when you look at the essence of fire, water, the elements or whatever, uh, it's energetic and it has healing properties. Uh, so there, so yes, to answer your question simply, yes, uh, alchemy did precipitate empirical science, including chemistry, but it came at a high cost. And all you have to yeah. do is look at the our relationship to nature, uh, you know, to see that with climate change and everything else. Yeah, we're at a, quite a pass today. Um, you you use the word soul. The, the, you say there was a loss of soul. So it sounds like your sense of soul is very intimately connected to that full immersion and experience of nature, of being part of nature. Yeah with yes. nature of nature yes yeah well let's not us forget that the etymology of the word psychology means love of soul yeah yeah and the soul we in, in alchemy there's a clear differentiate differentiation between soul and spirit soul uh in latin is anima uh, in, in the Latin, the spirit is animus. The former is more feminine nature and the latter more masculine. So that word anima, we use in very, you know, in, in, in English, the English language in words like animate. Okay, so uh, the soul has an enlivening effect. And one of the gifts of doing alchemical work uh, psychologically is exactly that. It carries meaning. We feel enlivened. We have purpose. Uh, it just brightens up the world in a way that you could have never imagined, you, you know, without it. Now, I'm not saying that alchemy is the only occult system that does that, but that's my particular specialization. Yeah. So in terms of the psychotherapy that you do, do you feel like you're doing... Jungian 
psychotherapy or is it a blend of traditions? Um, therapy ultimately is about liberation. It's okay. about freedom because until we have mastered our instincts, uh, I, I don't think that we've achieved a higher level of consciousness. In fact, I use that as a, a, a cutting criteria between, let's say, boys and men or girls and women. You know, there's a certain transition that takes place. Um, and what is the liberation from is from instincts or impulses uh, are going along with, you know, the, what the media says without critical, critically questioning it. Uh, so it's really, a, so we're living life by choice, by design, not just what happened to us. I choose to live my life in a certain way. And what that does is it deconstructs habits, which are very well entrenched and they, uh, they have a momentum. And so what therapy does, typically a patient will come with a problem and that's a great starting point. And then we begin to do the work, not just of what's going on in their outer life, which is of course important, but also what's going on in their inner life. So we use dream analysis, et cetera, to, you know, active imagination to get into that world. Yeah. Now, over the course of time, if you back up in context, we know quite a bit about evolution. But the word that's really missing in the development of human consciousness is involution. So we're living these kind of two parallel lives. Mm -hmm. And what therapy can do is join those together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a, a, a uh, useful perspective, I think, an interesting way of, of, of putting it. What about the miracle stories <laughs> that I alluded to at the beginning of our conversation there, that are on your website? They're kind of like the car crash accident that happened in the therapy that you told us about. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, one of my favorites, looking back, and this came right after I had published, Putnam had published my first book, I started to get fan mail you know, through emails. Wonderful. <laughs> and, yeah, it was, it's great. And I, and from time to time, I still do uh, because I followed up with a second book. So I get some that are more referenced uh, to the second book. But the one that I recall that really, really was validating for me was uh, when a woman uh, wrote me and she was suicidally depressed as she described herself. And she had it in mind um, to poison herself. That was going to be her method of killing herself. But didn't know anything about toxins or poisons. So she went to the library and she was in like sort of the gardening botanical section. <laughs> and Because she's looking for a book on how to mix up a brew that would end her life. And, you know, we've heard this story so many times in other contexts, but it actually happened according to what she wrote to me. I don't know how my book, Alchemical Psychology, Old Recipes for Living in a New World, dropped on her head. <laughs> it actually dropped know. on her head. Dro somehow or other, it, you know, it was misplaced or wow. however it happened, she yeah. it caught her attention. And the status line in the email was, as I, I sharply recall, your book saved my life. How so? How to go from there? What happened after that? That was the one and only email I got from her. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, but more generally, more generally. Uh, through an alchemical perspective, the way we view death is not linear. It's not like birth, you know, uh, childhood, adolescence, and then someday you, you just die. Uh, it's much more shamanic in the sense that uh, death is seen as a part of the transformation process. One of the, one of the recipes in the book, and, and really it's as Edward Edinger calls it, a foundational recipe, in the Latin, it's salve et coagula, which means to dissolve, 
and coagulate. And uh, we are constantly, and we know this now physically, with no small uh, 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 credit to a man named Ernest Rutherford, who was a physicist, I believe it was in 1917, that demonstrated the first in a laboratory transmutation, in that case, of thorium into radium. So in other words, what the alchemists intuitively knew, all right, proved to be true when empirical science comes along and shows that trans transmutations, transformations are happening all the time. But in the process of how that works, there's a dissolution. So the first part, you know, there's a, a death process. In the first stage of alchemy, it's called the negrito, the Latin yeah. word meaning blackening. And yeah, it's right. in that stage when we do shadow work, you know, we confront those dark, uh, very powerful in terms of potential energies, and we transmute them. But before we can do that, we have to break our, down our habits and routines and our ordinary way of living yeah. life. And so it's a death process. There's even an operation, two operations, one called mortificatio. And you don't have to know Latin <laughs> to figure out what uh -huh. that word means. Yeah. Uh, so you have to break things down to their elemental form. But then there is the coagulation, meaning that you're reconstituting you know, whatever it is that the problem uh, that you find yourself in into a more superior perfected form. Yeah. So we have a very different view of how death is part of our everyday moment. And when we start to accept that, and I'm thinking now we're Plato, you know, Plato in his own words summarizes his whole, whole philosophy with two words, practice dying. So if you embrace death, not in a physical way so much, although we're changing our bodies every seven years or so, but psychologically, we are also doing that. But to think psychologically, we have a more purposeful hand, a more conscious hand in enabling us to make a transformation that's not just to our benefit, but the benefit of our families, our state, our country, even the world. And what better time than now when the opposites, because Jung's psychology is based on a theory of opposites, that everything, physically and otherwise, is in opposition. And now we find ourselves in a, in a, in a time of history where those opposites are, are, are just straining at the extremes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if we don't find a way to create what alchemists call the, the mysterium conunciotis, the, the joining, the royal marriage, I really question the fate of humanity. Right, right. Uh, maybe you'd like to say something about these two books that you wrote that you've mentioned, just to give people a sense of what they might find in uh, in each of those. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the first book, because it was published by Putnam, was a more popular book. They wanted it to be a manual, which I wasn't comfortable with that word, but it, it's a very more popular introduction to some of the, the, the founding principles of al alchemical psychology. The book was constructed in an odd way. It was constructed from the inside out. <laughs> How so? Uh, so? So I began writing these essays. I didn't know what I was doing, where they were going. Yeah. Uh, but what happened was that each of the 10 recipes in the book uh, was the core of the book. And then, you know, I encased it, contextualized it. So it's a very practical book uh, uh, in terms of a, a, a prima, talking about the stages, talking about the elements, talking about the what they call the tria uh, prima, the three forces of uh, sulfur, uh, uh, mercury, and salt. And what those mean? I mean, those are, you know, it's not table so sodium we're talking about. Uh, salt has a, a fixating quality. In fact, if I take a moment, here's another example that comes to mind. So I had another patient, a real a middle-aged uh, uh, real estate woman who knew nothing about Jung or alchemy for sure. And her problem was she had just divorced her husband of many years. Both were in alcoholic recovery for many years, attending AA meetings and, and the like. And he, because out of habit, would you know sit next to her uh, uh, in an AA meeting, for example. And everywhere she went, there he was. And it was, and he didn't get the, the the memo that hey we're divorced, you know. Yeah. 
So she did this really kind of strange thing where I don't know what inspired this. She took a piece of paper and wrote on it his name. And then she stuck it in the freezer, thinking somehow or other that would resolve her problem. So she told me about this and I kind of gently laughed, you know, inwardly because I thought, well, and I did tell her, well, your intention is good, but you're using the wrong element. Because when you put something in a freezer, it fixates it, <laughs> which is the yeah. very opposite of what you want to achieve. Yeah. So I said, well, let's try, you know, burning it, you know, write the name on a piece of paper and burn it because fire is the symbol of the alchemical symbol of transformation. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, this is all true stuff I'm telling you because it not, not only did it work, but three months later, she had met a wonderful man and is married to this day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, so, that's what no, that's I meant just, by the, the miracle stories. You know, yeah, this, yeah. It, it also puts me in yeah. mind of, of Milton Erickson. I'm, you must be aware of Milton Erickson and, yeah. and uh, right. who did yeah. worked with people in very paradoxical ways that uh, yeah, absolutely. would, 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 dissolve them i guess to use your language would dissolve right, the, their right, right. understanding or their system that they were locked well, what, in. well what well what he did was to um uh one of the earliest hypnotists which of course erickson is a master he was a, a master hypnotist was Janet, and Janet had this french term abasement du nouveau mental which means a dimming of consciousness and that that's where you know we dissolve the fixated uh frame that we're looking through mm -hmm. and then talking essentially directly directly in its paradoxical language to the unconscious yeah uh and and jung uses a lot of of that kind of talk not that he was a hypnotist uh but the first book is a popular introduction um, and then some years later, I wrote a second book uh, called Embodying Osiris, um, The Secrets of Al Alchemical Transformation. That book was published by Quest, which was the then uh, publishing arm of the theological, uh, uh, Theosophical Society. And uh, it, it, again, it was just happenstance the way uh, they reached out to me uh, because of a talk that I had given. And uh, he asked if I had material. And I said, sure, I just wrote this paper, which he absolutely wasn't interested in, nor was Putnam, by the way. But I had just on a lark stuck in another short paper I had written on ancient Egypt. He was on fire. And so that's how uh, fortuitously I got the second book published. And soon after... Uh, I was visiting ancient Egypt. I mean, I was visiting Egypt to look at the ancient hieroglyphs and what have you. And in fact, in March of next this coming year, I was invited to do a uh, a, a lecture or seminar on another tour back to Egypt. Um, now, the crux of that book goes right back to what I said earlier: the 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 the, the seminal recipe of salve et coagula dissolve and coagulate is mythically mythically represented so wonderfully by the story of osiris who is known as the god of death but as i've analyzed the figure in its current meaning to us he really is the god of regeneration now that book is much tends towards more of a scholarly uh audience uh it's very you know uh, very uh accessible but I wouldn't call it as much as the first book was popular. So that that's the birth of Osiris in my life. And he's still very much with me. Okay. Well, that's probably a good introduction to talking about these courses that you have, or a course that you have coming up, an uh, online right. course. So uh, this is your chance to pitch it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the course is it was retitled uh, the Introduction to Alchemical Psychology, uh, which it is, which it is, and it's a a series of six seminars uh, beginning in the fall, 
uh, it's sponsored by uh, uh, something called uh, the Young uh, uh, Young Academy, Young Academy, um, which is run. It's a it's a, a place uh, more than just classes. It's a place through which uh, people are directed to me, uh, referred to me, who desire a more uh, Jungian alchemical approach. Uh, in fact, it's called Jungian on um, JungianOnline.com. Um, and as I've been preparing and putting together the talk and the slides, each of which of the six seminars is 90 minutes long, I'm struggling. And what I'm struggling with is, even with all of that time, it's it's scarcely scratching the surface of uh -huh. what alchemy is really all about. Um, but it's a good introduction to, uh, you know, the things that you need to know just enough to be dangerous. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> One or two people over the years, all the 16 years I've been doing these uh, interviews and one or two people, maybe just one, had the temerity to say, what the heck do you mean uh, everything you need to know about psychology and just enough to be dangerous? And uh. I don't have a real sharp, <laughs> it just felt, it felt right. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, the thing is, the interesting thing is psychology is ubiquitous. I mean, we're all psychologists. Yeah. Now, some like myself are formally trained, but you, you can't look in any sector of life where there isn't psychology, whether it's the stock market or shooting people into space. So we're all psychologists, you know. Um, um, but what particularizes the Jungian view uh, is that we we do what's very essentially alchemical, and that is we facilitate our individuation process. So if I have a patient, for example, who is depressed, research shows that if nothing at all is applied, nothing is done, no therapy, uh, on average, it'll take like something like eight months to resolve. Now, what is my worth as a therapist? Well, wouldn't you like to cut that down to eight weeks? Because then we can consciously together facilitate your healing process. Yeah, and people, I think the general impression that people have about Jungian uh, analysis, at least, is that it's a very lengthy process. Uh, uh, not the way I do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's that. In I fact, I've coined the term, uh, yeah, I've coined the term uh, to the work I do as active analysis. Uh, as you might tell by my New York uh, background, <laughs> I tend to be very direct. Um, uh, so we analyze together. It's not like I'm analyzing you. Yeah. You know, because I'm in the vessel with you. Yeah. Yeah. So getting back to your course, it's a six-week training. And uh, how would people find out about that? Uh, uh, yeah. How And is it? in person or is it online or is it a mix yeah yeah um it will be online so it'll be video audio um and it's a global audience so i expect we'll have people from you know all corners of the world uh, wow. which would be wonderful yeah because as i've begun doing our chemical coaching and i'm unmoored with no small thanks to covid believe it or not uh, I'm now treating people from Kuwait to the Yucatan to um, Canada. You know, How exciting. Totally. Yeah, it's, it, it's actually wonderful. I'm enjoying it a lot from that perspective. Um, it's uh, a six-week course, each of which is uh, an hour and a half long. It's on Sundays from uh, Pacific time, 10 to 12, which kind of works for a European audience and elsewhere. Um, it's accessed online uh, through uh, the Young Academy. Uh, Academy. So that's J U N G A R C H E D E M Y dot com. That'll bring you directly to the registration page, which kind of describes in more detail of what the course entails and involves. It's yeah. quite, quite packing a lot in. Uh, yeah. It's 
uh, it's 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 not just uh, uh, I mean there'll be a lot of uh, historical data as some of which we've been speaking about today, uh, but it's also deconstructing some of the strange uh, um, symbolism and pictures and images of alchemy so that we understand what the hell it is we're we're seeing and how then the third part is how to apply it. Yeah, those pictures are fascinating. I've you know I've I've seen some of them in other places you said it was some, the time was that a morning time pacific or evening yes morning no it's 10 a.m to, to yeah noon. okay okay yeah. yeah so i'll yeah. put a link to that um, oh wonderful thank you yeah yeah i you know to me this is not something i do as i said earlier you know i think the world whether it's alchemical alchemical psychology or whatever it needs an elixir you know, it needs something that we, we get out of, like, in politics, you know, hyper-partisanism, partisanism. you know, we need to to somehow find, find something that could uh, remind us that we're not Democrats or Republicans, you know, that we're uh, Americans, uh, and we are citizens of this globe, of this world, that we're harming. Um, and there, I think that there is a middle passage. And I do believe that, you know, even changing one mind has a profound effect because in alchemy, we call the process multiplicatio. So if you're changed and more consciously aware and making deliberate ethical choices, as Gandhi said, politics begins by talking to your neighbor. And before you know it, you know, that has a positive influence on your neighbor, on your family. And they talk to their neighbors, et cetera. You know, all politics is local, as it said. So it doesn't take, a, you know, an overhaul of people's consciousness in terms of the numbers to change the path that we're on into a better uh, survivable uh, future. Uh, so when I say liberation, it's not just on a local personal level, individual level, because we all are part of a collective, a collective community a common unity of mind and that has that crosses all borders well that's an excellent wrap up for this interview tom okay. cavalli i want to thank you for being my guest today on shrink wrap radio yeah my pleasure thank you for having me fellow alchemist <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs>